This podcast is part three in a three-part series on rethinking culture in the context of civil-military relations. Folks on the ground may have a different understanding about security. Yeah. Just uh, so, hearkening back to the Somalia example, um, if I if I speak about uh, South Lebanon, where there's a United Nations uh, force interposed between Israel and and, uh, and Lebanon, there is a great concern with security. Right. Uh, they have the blue line that they patrol. They they have all sorts of mechanisms for. Uh, looking for violations of the UN uh, Security Council resolution that gives them their mandate. But in looking at what security means, when that unit goes and interviews people in the communities, um, their idea of what security is is different. Uh, What they're interested in is uh, education for their children, safety for their children, food and, and so on. And, right, like human and, security notions. Yes, so what, what, what happens then is part of the organizational culture defines what security is and then that's the represent, representational part of it, then it defines how we should right. act towards it. We set up a, a clear border, we set up clear processes for looking at uh, the violation of, of uh, the restrictions that are placed there. It tells us how to feel about it. Who's cheating and who's not cheating? Right. And that's different for the for the force than it is for the people in the community right. often. Not that they're completely different, but they, they overlap, and it's hard to, 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 to see them as a unitary kind of thing. And I, I think we could think of that notion of security, of human security that you're yeah. talking about. It could be called perhaps stakeholder security sure. or local stakeholder sure. community. Um, standards of security, and it, the the only problem again, the problem is that mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, a, a mission oriented force right. is never going to be able to be as nuanced yes, as and agile, right? As you know, um, zeroed in to what the needs of a local community are, mm-hmm. as a local community would like, and that's where some of these conflicts become political questions, mm-hmm. right? I mean, this is why, you know, when folks are critical when other scholars and um, observers are critical of the post 9-11 wars, they talk about how there really was never a political solution that was prioritized and implemented and part of the difficulty for the U.S. and all of this and coalition forces is it wasn't their political solution to impose. And so that's a fundamental game stopper for being able to actually have, I mean, if a local community doesn't have political mechanisms whereby their stakeholders, their constituencies can represent their needs and desires with respect to the most fundamental issues such as security and then culture. Without that, it's almost impossible for any implementing force to actually execute on that Absolutely. desire. And Absolutely. so that's ultimately one of the real obstacles to this process. It is a real obstacle, but it also... It also is it an opportunity? Uh, it's not, I'm not going to say it's an opportunity. I'm going to say that it, it's, created, it's created another challenge. Uh, and, and that challenge uh, is that because uh, the, of, uh, of the, the complexity that you've just described, uh, one could say that in these, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere, we have militarized good. security. Yep, that's good. Uh, and part of... Uh, and foreign policy. And foreign policy. And part of, of that m- means uh, uh, what I'll just assert is an overinvestment in... Uh, in material and, and that kinetic solutions, kinetic solutions. and when uh, when we leave those theaters of operation, we have excess oh, okay. things. So we're shifting so, now from the international realm into the domestic. Right. So now it's a question society. of how it is that that this then affects domestic civil military relations, yeah. and part of it is uh, militaries. Uh, the government is now faced with having all this excess material, and some of it appeals to. Uh, to say local uh, police departments. Right. Now, in part of making this sort of shift to, to the domestic, it's, it's worth noting that part of the militarization of security, part of the militarization of some humanitarian action resulted from the hiring of former military folks who brought with them into the humanitarian organizations their military expertise, military expertise and they Habits. shaped it, that. In the same way, uh, in our uh, at home, we have uh, you know more veterans, 
and uh, many of whom, or some of whom become uh, law enforcement uh, mm -hmm. officials who uh, think in the, that having some of the access to the excess material would be very useful for them. Right. So. Yeah, so this is a, an interesting um, phenomenon in general, I think. And I, I, we definitely should drill down into the weeds, but just to provide our, our audience oh, yeah, sure. with a little bit of context. One of the interesting phenomenons that happened with the way in which the U.S. responded to the, the series of, of um, attacks involved in 9-11, in there was a, a strategic shift, right? I mean, first of all, we went into Afghanistan, mm -hmm. lawful war according to the UN, mm -hmm. right? Then Iraq on top of that, and then stood up th through the request of many um, sovereign nations, mm -hmm. more counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, mm -hmm. um, interoperable campaigns all over the world, Djibouti to Somalia to... So there was a kind of template that was used after 9-11 for how we managed um, the, the threat of terrorism, the kind of uh, failed state, troubled state phenomenon that mm -hmm. left states open to being safe havens for terrorism. And one of the interesting things that happened in that process is that the strategy we deployed abroad mm -hmm. had rebound effects back okay. into the domestic arena. And some of the things that we didn't expect to see are now on the home front. Mm -hmm. And there's a range of things that we could talk about, and we'll talk about militarization of the police so that some of the tactics from kind of counterinsurgency wars mm -hmm. at home are end up, are uh, abroad, mm -hmm. or end up brought to be brought mm -hmm. home. But there are other dynamics of this as well. So we can talk about, you know, surveillance technology, right? That's, you know, it was stood up with the post 9-11 wars, and now it's become fairly routinely used at home um, in ways that many have criticized um, the use of these surveillance technologies. Um, there are other, you know, weapon technologies. Drones is another issue. Now we have domestic drones, drones. right, which are creating regulatory issues at home. Um, there's this issue of believing or presuming that kinetic solutions solve all problems um, when that's not necessarily the truth, right? I mean, there's, there's different, we have a whole um, repertoire of national instruments of power that can be used to solve any given set of very complex, even wicked problems, and the resort to just military tools ends up creating, you know, problems and um, rebound effects that then are are problematic, including at home. Right. So one of the th one of the things that I think is Im important to 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 realize here uh, is that the the shift towards uh, towards kinetic uh, uh, solutions is is itself a, a result of an underlying cultural model That's uh, and that is and that is what is risk and how does how do you deal with that that risk and what you're observing I think is that that we have particular ways of identifying risk in the international arenas that we've now brought home and we have applied those logics to to what the risk is here and the result is, uh, not to be banal about this, that we have a hammer and we see things as nails. Right. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's the issue. I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about some of the policing, um, I don't know, some of the examples so, that we use in our paper. I, we don't so, have to, so, but I think it's... So it's, it's worth knowing that... Just that, one example, uh, I think, would help. That, well, so we're sitting here in Syracuse, New York, right. uh, at, which is a very small, uh, small city. Uh, it has uh, a variety of, of uh, wonderful things about it and a variety of, of challenges. Um, but it has received, uh, I would have to get the exact number, yeah. uh, something like half a million dollars in uh, military material uh, and armored uh, uh, vehicles. vehicles and so on, uh, that once you have them, People you, like you use like to use yeah. them, uh, and and that creates a, a challenge in, in for the police um, getting close to uh, some members of the community. It goes against, say, for example, community policing, right. where where you have closer uh, relationship, closer civilian uh, oversight uh, of. of uh, please. So those and, and that's integration a of integration. communities and right. open lines of communication. 
And one of, one of the interesting things about this phenomenon of militarizing local policing is that, and this is something that we bring up in the paper, one of the most effective critics of this process has been Afghan and Iraqi veterans. veterans. So U.S. military service members who were deployed abroad mm -hmm. multiple times usually in these conflicts Absolutely. looked at some of the lessons they learned around culture and security interactions and felt like the response at home, especially to some of the, I think the St. Louis. The Ferguson. Yeah. yeah, Ferguson race riots and other yeah. issues. They felt the response was over militarized. Right. And they felt like that some of the the kind of culture integration lessons that they had learned abroad would be much more usefully right. implemented okay. in that context. Yeah. And, you know, we cite some examples from veterans speaking out openly in the news yes. about this. Absolutely. And actually going to local police departments and saying, hey, why don't you try um, this form of open communication? Why don't you try um, uh, points, persons in the community that are, that are African American, for, for instance, but are already trusted members mm -hmm of the police to open lines of communication with um, communities who are, are protesting an issue that involved uh, race and African Americans. Yeah, absolutely. So they suggested all these really interesting solutions to this problem, much of which ended up discussing this culture security dynamic so that, that we've been exploring. So it, it's, it, that is a great example, by the way, of how, how uh, complex <laughs> this is. You can't paint all military veterans as uh, looking for kinetic solutions. You can't paint them That's all right. as objecting to those, but it is like any society, any culture, there, there are uh, various and sometimes, uh, sometimes strains of understanding that are in tension with one another. The, the really uh, uh, perhaps interesting thing about, um, about that is we talk about the way in which in anthropology and in sociology, we talk about the way in which social structure constrains the activities of, of, of people. Um, I can't, if I ask you to take public transportation to get to an appointment uh, and there's no public transportation that comes regularly, right. you may miss that appointment, that's a constraint on you. Having uh, the military equipment becomes a structural co constraint as mm -hmm. well that one has to be very thoughtful to, to, to say, okay, this might, we have it, maybe we shouldn't use it, maybe we should approach it differently. Yeah, in a non-kinetic way, in a way that understands what the concerns are of, of the of the folks who are uh, who we're dealing with. Right, and I, I'm thinking one of one of our examples that we we cite in the sure. paper of outgoing Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman Martin Dempsey, who talks about this kind of troubled relationship sure. between yeah. civil and military relations, and part of it is just different. I mean, we've emphasized the culture and security sure. dynamism, but part of it is too is you know, just functionally different institutional missions that, that are have cultural underlays. There's no question about it. Um, but that are designed to be different. And mm -hmm. part of this is our constitutional heritage, right, that we have a civilian leadership over the military, mm -hmm. right? So this is a, you know, kind of a, a U.S. Uh, cultural value, mm -hmm. constitutional norm. Mm -hmm. But there are ways in which this kind of civil military relationship is always going to be, as Dempsey says, a rocky road. Right, absolutely. And that's part of, a, one might say, a useful friction or a useful tension. The, the, the point, though, is to, even if there are, is, is a permanent rocky road for civil right. military relations, the point is to try to um, use that, that friction, that constitutional friction. Constructively. It, constructively, in right. a way that um, advantages the U.S. mission abroad when it has to involve um, peace building and stabilization and winning wars, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, making sure that those constitutional protections are protected at home, you know, so that, okay, there may be moments where some of these strategic initiatives from our, our um, policies abroad end up coming home. There should be enough experts in the community, enough protections, checks and balances, so that people, including veterans but beyond, are critical of these Absolutely. dynamics in ways that we can come up with more measured solutions right. for local application of some of these. And, and that brings with it a recognition that these are complex issues yep. that require a good deal of um, sometimes expertise to help advise about how to, to, to navigate through them. 
and public commentary yeah. and local stakeholders giving their point of view on absolutely. these issues. Absolutely. So that seems like a good place to end. Absolutely it does. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank so. you for the conversation today.